Uh, so welcome everyone. Uh, the speaker today is Martina Scolamiero, and the title of her talk is Extracting Persistence Features with Hierarchical Stabilization. Thank you very much, Sarah, for the introduction uh, and um, to the organizers for having me at uh, this talk. It's a great pleasure to be here. So today I will be talking about uh, hierarchical civilization and the type of invariance we get through this. And this is um, ongoing work, which actually started so some years ago uh, with the TDA group at, at KTH. So let's get started. Uh, here is, is the plan of my talk. Uh, I will start uh, introducing a way to define distances between persistence modules and uh, generalized persistence modules uh, motivated by multi-parameter persistence. Uh, I, I will then continue um, by saying what we actually do with these distances. We use these distances not just to compare persistence modules, but to define uh, invariants. For, for them, which actually are stable. This is the main property that comes from this uh, construction. Um, I will then talk about some things that we are able to do and are working out in the one parameter case. And these are inspiring for work we want to continue in the multi-parameter case, although there are more, many more challenges in, in that uh, realm there. Okay, but uh, let's get started. And these are the mathematical objects this uh, talk will we'll study. We fix a uh, field K and a natural number. Uh, consider the poset Q to the R with um, order given component wise. So we have the, the vector X1, XR, smaller or equal than Y1, YR, if XI is a smaller or equal than YI for I from one to R look at components. And uh, we define a persistence module uh, as a functor from Q to the R to vector spaces. So for each V, we have vector K vector space. And uh, every time V is a smaller or equal than W, we have a map from FV to FW. Note that these maps are not necessarily inclusions. When R is equal to two, we are basically looking at diagrams which look like this. And for each vertex here in this grid, I usually play with, I have a vector space for each map I have, uh, for each arrow, I have a linear map and these squares, sorry, these squares here are commutative because we are looking at functors. So if I go this way and then this way, it's the same as going up and then to the right. Okay, so these are, uh, the persistence modules, the algebraic objects we will study. And um, it's also uh, important to uh, restrict to a class of persistence modules. The, the one we will consider are so-called tame persistence modules. Everybody has uh, their favorite definition of tameness. This is the one we had, uh, we had chosen at the time. So uh, in particular, we would like to have a grid um, underlying the structure of the persistence module such that in squares or cube or regions of this grid, the persistence module is stable. So if you want to write it properly, then we would say that uh, a functor is alpha tame, where alpha is a constant, if uh, for every v in n to the r and x, which is of length at most alpha, f alpha v plus x is isomorphic to f alpha v as a vector space. When we look at this picture here, this means that in this region, excluding the boundary, everything is constant. So if I move here by a vector of length alpha, then all the vector spaces are isomorphic to the ones in the lower left corner. Actually, we also want the vector spaces to be uh, finite dimensional and we consider functors which have all isomorphisms after a certain point. So these form compact objects. So let's move on. Um, how do we quantify uh, the size, a notion of size for, for functors? This is done through the notion of noise systems, uh, which are a collection of sets of tame functors. So we have these sets of tame functors and we collect them and we want some properties that are shared by, by the collection. So um, functors that are noise of size at most epsilon, we call them S epsilon. And the zero functor, which is zero everywhere, 
is noise of size S, S epsilon for every epsilon. So zero is arbitrarily small. This is a condition that seems sensible to us. And then actually these uh, neighborhoods of the zero, this set of uh, functors are growing. So if tau is smaller ripple than epsilon, then S tau is contained in S epsilon. So we can consider them as neighborhoods of the zero functor which are growing. Like metric balls, or actually from them we will build metric balls. And then we have um, this condition about uh, short exact sequences. So if you have a short exact sequence, FGH, and uh, G is a noise of size epsilon, then F and H are also noise of size epsilon. So sub functors and quotient of noise of a given size are also noise of the same size. And if F is noise of size epsilon and H is noise of size tau, then G is noise of size at most epsilon plus tau. So if it's in the middle of a short exact sequence, it cannot be much more in size than the extremes of the short exact sequence from which is built. These are the axioms that define noise systems and how we define the size of a factor. So it became a bit big. So now we, we look at uh, examples of, uh, of such functors. And uh, we look, for example, at um, the first example is a standard noise in, in the direction of a cone. So this was um, uh, motivated by generalizing the notion of interleaving. So it has actually some properties which uh, make it similar to interleaving. And um, we say that something is epsilon small according to standard noise in the direction of a cone. So we have a cone of direction of directions, this is B, if each vector space um, goes to zero, when you consider each its image in, the dire in some direction of the cone for a vector of length at most alpha. So this will be more clear with this example. So for example, here, consider this, uh, um, this functor here, which is uh, one t. So we, we expect this to be one from here to here, it's, it's one and from here to here, it's one. And uh, we can consider um, just a ray, not actually the cone. So the, the ray in the direction of the diagonal here. And we can see that all vector spaces go to zero when you move them in the direction of the diagonal by a vector of length one. So this, this uh, factor here is noise of size one, according to this particular uh, noise system. So this one goes to zero, this one goes to zero, this one goes to zero, but it's enough, uh, it's enough to check on generators actually. Otherwise, a bit more exotic type uh, of noise system is a domain noise, where we have a, a, a sequence of uh, subsets of, of the plane so regions in the parameter space, and they have to be nested, one contained in the other, and uh, yeah, so they have to be growing. And we say that uh, a functor is epsilon small if its support, so where the functor is non-zero, is contained in the epsilon element of the sequence of regions. And then we can consider another type of uh, exotic type of uh, noise system. And this is dimension noise, where we have a bound on the dimension of the vector spaces in, in the functor we are considering. So we have a, a list of natural numbers and epsilon, and um, with the condition that n tau plus n epsilon is a smaller equal than n tau plus epsilon for each tau and epsilon in Q. And we say that something is epsilon small if all the vector spaces are of dimension at most n epsilon. So here we have a bound on the dimension of the vector spaces instead. These are all definitions that work in, in the multi-parameter case. We didn't use a decomposition, but uh, if we consider um, now persistence modules with a decomposition, so for example, one, one parameter case, um, one can uh, see this notion of a p-norm that was introduced by uh, Kate Turner and Primo Scrabo. Uh, in, in their paper about uh, stability for Wasserstein distances. And uh, the p-norm of a persistence module with this barcode decomposition 
is defined as the sum of the pth power of the length of the bars in the barcode decomposition to the one over p, if p is different from infinity, or otherwise the maximum length of the bar, one p is equal infinity. So we have p norms, and uh, it's actually proved uh, in, in their paper that uh, p norms form uh, a noise system. So the axioms of uh, noise systems are verified by these p norms. So one can consider also noise which resembles um, this notion of, of p noise. Now, uh, noise systems can have various properties. So we have these various examples of noise systems. Um, they are not really families up to now, it's more like sporadic examples, but we can consider uh, the, some of their properties. Uh, we say that one of the properties we like is being closed under direct sums. A noise system is closed under direct sum if for every x and y, which are noise of size at most epsilon, then their direct sum is also noise of size at most epsilon. And actually, we can see that um, standard noise and domain noise are closed under direct sum. This is quite intuitive because uh, if we sum two domains which are zero in some part, then also the sum will be zero in that part. And also with standard noise, we ask a condition on all the elements. So all the generators have to be zero when you push them in the directions of the cone. And uh, instead, our, our types of noise systems are, are not closed under the right sounds. And uh, these are, for example, these P norm noise systems and the dimension noise. So this is a property that is useful, but it's not shared by all noise systems. What we had in mind when we had uh, defined this notion of noise system was to use them to understand how close two objects are, two persistence modules are. In practice, we want to define metric neighborhoods with respect to a pseudo metric on the space of persistence modules. And this is actually what, what we can see with this definition here. So we have a noise system uh, as epsilon, and this induces a pseudometric on the space of 10 persistence modules. Uh, consider F and G uh, persistence modules. Um, we say that they are epsilon close if there exists a third object, H, and maps to F and G, such that the kernel and co-kernels of these maps are noise of size epsilon one, epsilon two, epsilon three, epsilon four. And when you sum up all of these contributions, you get up to epsilon. So you want to approximate F with H and G with H. And when you do this approximation, the sum of the errors is not more than epsilon. One of the reasons why we had in mind this idea of having this uh, triangle, this span, this H, is because uh, most times it's not possible to find a map from F to G or from G to H, which is non-trivial. So it's more useful to have uh, an interpolating object in, in the middle. And we can use um, this notion of epsilon closeness to define the distance. So the distance between F and G is the smallest epsilon such that F and G are epsilon close. Similarly, one can do, um, we've been looking at this recently, uh, one can do a slight variation of, of this definition and sum up the contributions, not with the L1 norm, uh, but with the P norm uh, on R4. Uh, so we have um, P power of the epsilons and then P root of this. And uh, when you use the noise system uh, associated to the uh, Wasserstein P norm, here we get the P Wasserstein distance as it was defined by Turner and uh, Scrabble. Uh, there's uh, a question for me maybe, or? That's right. Um, yeah, so Jasha asks, is there a reason the arrows go from H to F and G or would it work equally well if the arrows went from um, G and F to H? Yes, so it's, it's the same. Uh, you, you can do both. Um, if you have an interpolating object sending to F and G, you also have an interpolating object um, from F and G. You can take the push out. So it's, it's equivalent. One can define in both ways. You're welcome. Okay, okay so um, we can uh, actually, in the one parameter case, uh, recover the p-vasis time distance 
uh, I mean, the algebraic version as defined by uh, Turner and Scraba in its ongoing work with uh, Guidolin and Jagerberg to, to understand this type of distances and what is their impact on what I'm going to tell you now. So um, once we have a distance, this could be distances induced by noise systems or any other distance you like on uh, persistence modules. Uh, we can uh, do this um, trick of uh, hierarchical stabilization. The hierarchical stabilization means um, to take an invariant, a numerical invariant of your persistence module and minimize it in metric, metric neighborhoods of your functor. So you have your persistence module F or your functor, and then you consider, and then you consider metric neighborhoods with respect to a distance D. You have also agreed on an invariant that you want to minimize. Uh, then I will specify the type of invariant we've been minimizing, but it, it's easier if it is a numerical invariant of your persistence module. And um, by minimizing this invariant in uh, metric neighborhoods, uh, you, you obtain a function which is piecewise constant and not increasing because these neighborhoods are growing. So you have bigger and bigger neighborhoods and you uh, minimizing bigger and bigger balls, metric balls. This is the formal definition. We obtain piecewise constant function, which in zero is actually the value of your invariant on F, and for T is the infimum of your invariant in the metric ball of radius T centered in F. Um, this construction um, is uh, particularly uh, interesting um, because it uh, satisfies uh, a stability property. So it's um, no surprise here, we call this hierarchical stabilization, so there's no need to leave the surprise during the talk. Um, but um, which metric would you like to use on the output uh, functions we are producing? One example of metric we can use is uh, interleaving distance on, on such functions. So for example, uh, f and g are epsilon interleaved if f of v, sorry, f and g, not g1 and g2, but if f of v is greater or equal than f of v plus epsilon, that's correct, f of v is greater or equal than g of v plus epsilon, and g of v is greater or equal than f of v plus epsilon for each v. And we can define the interleaving distance between uh, two functions as the infimum among all epsilon such that these two functions are interleaved. So here is the stability result I was mentioning before. So this function that uh, goes from the set of tame persistence module with a fixed metric to the space of functions from zero infinity to zero infinity with interleaving metric, it's uh, one Lipschitz. So it's uh, stable. And actually uh, it's not necessary to have uh, the interleaving distance on the space of functions, we could also consider integral distance or a p integral distance. And we still have um, stability because of these relations between distances between functions here. But actually when we use integral distance or LP integral distance, we have to account for a constant, um, which depends on F and G on your persistence modules. So uh, overall this process, of uh, turning this discrete invariant n into a function uh, produces uh, stable results and a stable way to go from persistence modules to, to functions. Um, what, uh, what type of invariant uh, can we use? Uh, our, our idea for this or what we've been working on so far uh, is the rank. So I will now um, recall what, uh, what we mean by the rank of a persistence module. Thin functors, the functors we are looking at have a finite projective dimension. So you can have um, finite, uh, short ex um, finite projective resolutions and you can compute multigraded Betty numbers of them, which tells you about positions of generators and relations and higher order CCGs. Um, the rank, which is the invariant, which we uh, consider now of a tame functor is the sum over all uh, B zero B. So we count the number of generators of the persistence module. 
basically um, in the one dimensional case when you have a barcode to decomposition what we're looking at is simply just the number of bars so this is a very very simple invariant discrete invariant very simple invariant not stable with respect to the metrics you usually have on persistence modules we look at the number of bars but then we can stabilize it and compute a function out of it with this process of the hierarchical stabilization so when i do hierarchical stabilization of the rank I look at my functor f, my persistence module, its rank, and then I grow metric balls with respect to a metric d, which I have fixed. So the, the metric is actually important, and I compute the rank in these metric neighborhoods here. And this produces a function, which looks more, more or less like this. So it's a piecewise constant function. Now I, I will show later on examples of, of these type of functions. Okay, so uh, let's first start with a very simple example. The type of examples I were, was working on uh, by hand in the, in the beginning when we started working on this. And um, so we have this very simple uh, persistence module here. And uh, the number of generators of this persistence module is two. We have uh, two generators, this one and this one. In fact, all the vector spaces can be considered as the image of these two. And so the rank in the beginning for this persistence module here is two. But then um, at distance alpha, if we consider this persistence module to be alpha tain, so Actually here, the length is alpha. This is the size of the grid, which I'm looking at. We have another persistence module, which is alpha close and just has rank one. So after alpha, so here we start at zero, but after alpha, we go to rank one and then it stays by one. In this next slide, I have the example again. So here we have these two generators and this is the original module. And then I can see that I can include into this a persistence module with one unique generator, which has rank one. So this has rank two, this has rank one. Because it has one unique generator, it is a free functor. And how close are they? Where, where is this uh, second functor here with respect to the first one? Well, it's in a metric neighborhood of size alpha, because if I look at their quotient, this is noise of size alpha. So if I call this A, B, and the quotient C, I want to do hierarchical stabilization of B. And when I look at this metric neighborhood, when I go to radius of size alpha, I find A. somewhere here in the metric neighborhood, and this has rank one. Then actually I cannot go lower than, than one because this is not noise of size, anything. Three functors have constant rank. You cannot lower that stable. So this is the stable rank for this very simple example, which one can work by hand. Actually, it's worth noting that in this metric neighborhood, there doesn't exist a unique factor which minimizes the rank. There can be infinitely many. These metric neighborhoods are very, very complicated. It's actually very complicated to algorithmically compute this hierarchical stabilization just because these metric neighborhoods are very mysterious objects and they depend on the metric too, of course. So uh, let's move uh, to a couple of words uh, regarding the computations. Uh, before I have mentioned um, this uh, notion of um, noise in the demand, in the in standard noise in the direction of array, which is equivalent to the interleaving distance uh, by Lesnik. And we can have a generalization of uh, such standard noise by so-called simple noise systems. Now, I, I will not recall which are the axioms of simple noise systems, but uh, for, for this type of uh, noise systems, which have some properties in common to standard noise or interleaving as you prefer, uh, one can prove, and this was work by 
Oliver Gaffers and Wojtek Kochulski that the minimal rent can be obtained by subfactors. We had already observed this for standard noise. So one can restrict to a class of factors, which are actually the sub-objects, and just look into them to find the minimum. This is uh, a strategy for computation to restrict to subclasses of functors. Uh, Oliver proved in his master thesis that uh, for a stable rank, also when one uses standard noise, actually if we consider a finite phi, if finite phi field, uh, then there are finitely many computations, but uh, uh, the, the algorithm to do this is NP-hard. So the problem is NP-hard. This is a very uh, rich environment, so it's, it's complicated to compute it. But um, uh, one, one, uh, one thing to, to notice is that uh, while trying to compute this uh, stable rank in a multi-parameter uh, persistence, uh, they have introduced this notion of contours, uh, which are a way to handle simple noise systems. Contours are the same as the simple noise systems. And there are a way to handle them for um, computations and algorithmic computations, but also uh, a way to generate new simple noise systems. So I, I will now go to the one dimensional case and uh, show some insights that we have uh, by using the contours. Um, some of this material was already um, looked into by Henry Rihimaki and Wojtek Kowalski, which have considered uh, contours in one-dimensional persistence. So uh, what, what is a contour? A contour is a function from zero infinity times zero infinity to zero infinity. So from the monoid zero infinity times the pose at zero infinity to zero infinity, uh, which um, satisfies some properties. So C A zero is A. If I act by zero, I'm still there. Then C of C a epsilon tau is equal to C A epsilon plus tau. So we have this additivity condition in, in the second variable. And then it's order preserving. So if A is more or equal than B and epsilon is more or equal than tau, then C A epsilon is more or equal than C B tau. This is a way to reparameterize intuitively, to reparameterize the parameter space and to understand how fast or how slow you want to go in different regions of the parameter space. This intuition will be clearer later on when I show some examples. And uh, with contours, it's actually easy uh, to produce many types of metrics. So in, in this sense, I just had a bunch of examples before uh, I could enumerate on, on my hand. And now with contours, we have huge families of distances between persistence models that can be built. As for example, this one, which start from densities. So consider a, a measurable function f from zero to uh, zero infinity to zero infinity and define a, a contour in this way. Uh, to a epsilon, we associate df a epsilon, that is how much I have to go um, to obtain an integral under the curve, which is epsilon. So it's the value such that from A to that value, if I integrate my function, I obtain epsilon. This is a, a contour, uh, which is obtained from densities, but there are many other ways to obtain contours from densities. And this can be seen also in the paper by Henry and Wojtek. So now uh, we have um, a large number of uh, functions. Uh, which produce uh, a large number of invariants. And uh, the problem comes uh, to understand how to evaluate these invariants. So uh, we start from the assumptions that we need many distances to compute, to compare persistence module, that for one experiment uh, and a different experiment, not necessarily the same distance is the correct one. One should look into different distances for different data analysis problems. But now that we have many, how to evaluate which uh, distance is the best for a given data analysis problem or a classification problem. What, what we did here um, with um, Jens Agenberg, uh, Ryan Ramanujan and, and Wojtek uh, was to consider um, a kernel based on the stable rank. So, um, and this kernel is, can be used 
in, in conjunction with machine learning, so support vector machine, uh, to evaluate how well uh, these invariants uh, are for uh, classifying data in a supervised learning task. So we have started uh, from the space of persistence modules uh, with, with uh, distance, and we have moved to the space of functions. And uh, if we consider the L2 distance on the space of functions, which very well behaved space, uh, then this is a Hilbert space. And we consider uh, the inner product between functions and construct a kernel in this way. So the kernel associated to the metric D between persistence modules X and Y is this integral from zero infinity uh, of the stable rank according to D of X times the stable rank according to D of Y. So it, it became very practical. We started from a very abstract setting. We started um, specifying variables. We look at the rank, we fix uh, a distance and um, we are actually also in the one parameter case where computations are very fast here and we can compute a, a kernel. And uh, this turned out to be very useful when you have uh, data analysis. I, I will just show uh, an artificial data set here, but we are also working with, uh, with real data. But I think this, this example is, is quite illustrative to understand how, how we deal uh, with this. Um, uh, Martina, we have one question. Uh, how does the rank depend on X? The stable rank of X, right? This is, uh, yes. So um, we start with X and uh, we look at uh, metric neighborhoods of X. So what is close to X? And um, minimizing the invariant in metric neighborhoods, we get this function. So this function uh, starts at the rank of X. So if uh, let's consider the one dimensional case, we have a barcode. Um, the initial value is the number of bars of this barcode. But then depending on the distance, some barcodes are closer than others to this one. And um, according to what is close, then we look at the minimum rank there and this function start, uh, start dropping. So consider, for example, we are, we are considering um, D, which is like interleaving distance. And my X is a, is a barcode where all the bars are of length epsilon, but they are all over the place. Now, um, this function here in the beginning will just be the number of bars in my barcode, the stable rank of X, this number of bars. But after epsilon, this drops down to zero because all the bars are of length epsilon. So now with the stable rank, we're not just looking at the invariant itself on X, but how this is compared to the invariant on um, Functors in a metric neighborhood. Does this answer the question? So X is the center of the action. We look at the invariant on X and how this compares to the invariants of the functors which are close. Shall I shall I continue? And uh, yes, please do. I think uh, uh, I didn't see any further messages. Yeah, I got it. Okay, confirmation. Yes, okay. Uh, also, um, let's say that in this very uh, simple case of uh, one dimensional persistence and interleaving distance, so standard noise, uh, the stable rank uh, ends up being uh, a bar count. And it's actually a histogram, uh, it's equivalent to a histogram of the length of the bars. So here you can see that you have a number of bars and they are of length epsilon. But then when you start changing, uh, the distance with respect, for example, to a contour, bars that are space uh, ha have start having different lengths. So we want to understand which parts of the parameter space actually play a role in distinguishing classes of barcodes. We don't look at the barcode by himself, but as compared to others. And if we have a classification problem, 
and we have classes, we want to look where these barcodes or persistence modules are different. And this can be done and evaluated actually in very practical terms with this uh, stable rank kernel. So uh, let's go to this uh, simple artificial data set. And uh, we have shapes, um, circle, rectangle, triangle, and this M-shaped path. Uh, we sample 100 points from each shape uh, 50 times. So we obtain a data set, which is labeled by the shapes we have sampled from. And uh, we can run a stable rank. These stable ranks, um, they are just functions. So we can compute their average and their standard deviation. And uh, one can look here on the, on the left. Here is uh, H1 persistence with just standard uh, noise. So uh, this is like interleaving distance. And we already get a pretty high accuracy in distinguishing them, so 88.5%. But then um, we thought, OK, maybe some other contour, some other distance is better at distinguishing these shapes. So we randomly uh, sampled piecewise constant functions which we used as densities to build distances, so contours. And um, we did this with a cross-validation procedure on the result of support vector machine. And actually, the optimal, uh, the optimal contour gave a better classification of 94.7%. So this is the type of game we are, we are doing with data. So we have classes, and we would like to see if these classes can be distinguished by, by stable rank. And uh, can we distinguish them uh, with standard contour? So just looking at the length of the bars, or is it better to weight different parts of parameter space differently? And this is done uh, and evaluated through uh, the, um, this uh, kernel we are using. Uh, one intuition that we can have, but this is not an algorithm, it's just an intuition, is that we can look at uh, Betty curves. So the Betty curve uh, just counts at each step of the parameter space how many bars you have in a barcode. So it's just a bar count here for each step of the parameter space. Not stable invariant, but here are the Betty curves. And we can see that they are actually different here in this part of the parameter space. And if we focus the attention here with our contour, this is actually better at distinguishing classes. So we want to highlight parts of the parameter space where the groups have different behaviors in terms of barcodes. But now, interestingly enough, um, these invariants can also be used to understand data with ambient noise. So here we added 30% of ambient noise, so uniform distribution from the square. And we, we all know that persistence is not stable, is not robust with respect to ambient noise. But uh, as an observation, we found it very useful to subsample the data and average. So if we, for example, subsample 20% of the uh, of the points 50 times and an average, we find a way, again, a distinction between the classes which had disappeared here on the left with the noisy data, with ambient noise. So this subsampling procedure and averaging, which is possible because we have these very simple functions, we construct these very simple functions as invariants, um, seem to be very robust to ambient noise. Uh, in particular, uh, if you look at um, accuracy of uh, classification with support vector machine with our, uh, uh, with our kernel, here uh, the accuracy in blue is without subsampling and the accuracy on the um, yellow curve is with subsampling. And we can see already that, for example, like with 50% of ambient noise, we have a very good accuracy like 75% accuracy. And this is not the case if you don't consider the, the subsampling uh, strategy. So this is uh, quite interesting and uh, intriguing for us. Last slide. So uh, in summary, um, I would like to um, say that um, with this hierarchical stabilization, we can produce invariants which are uh, stable and they can also be used for multi-parameter persistence. And um, one property we like of these invariants is that um, we can actually do machine learning with them. 
and uh, statistics because it's very simple uh, space of, of invariance we are, we are dealing with. And also one property which is um, interesting is that we obtain very many invariants. So according to the distance D you use for hierarchical stabilization, you get very many different invariants. So it's interesting to understand and compare them according to different types of uh, noise systems or, or distances. Thank you for your attention. Thank you. So I would like to invite everyone to unmute themselves and thank the speaker again. Um, now it's time for questions. Um, so, yeah, so as said, everyone is set to mute. So to ask questions, you have to unmute yourself. I'll ask a question first. Uh, thanks, Martina, for the nice talk. So was it essential that you used um, the rationals to sort of define your underlying post set, the rationals, you know, um, you know, where R was the dimension or, or could you have used the reals there? Yeah, so um, we could have used the reals. We, we should check a couple of things. So in principle, I would say we can use the reals. The, the reason uh, why we use the rational there is that um, when we compare um, modules with different um, size, so um, tain is alpha tain for different alphas, when you want to compare two, then you want to find the grid, which is okay for both. And um, if you do this for many, many, very many times, then you don't want to go into trouble. But uh, I would say that the Q is, is not essential there. We, we can do with R. But that makes sense. Uh, tameness in the sense of the finite dimensional vector space, I think that we like. And uh, also like uh, isomorphisms uh, from some point on in order to have a compact uh, set of objects. Right, right. Yeah, that makes sense why you're using the rationals to compare on common grids. And then I agree with your intuition. You can probably take some sort of limit, you know, if needed to move to there. That's good. Thanks. <laughs> um, more questions? Um, so in case people are shy, maybe then, uh, thanks Martina again, I will stop the recording and we can have the rest of the questions uh, offline. Thank you. Thank you.